Jack. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to number you off, identify you. We've got some wood that needs to be cut. We've got uh, we've got to get the baptistry finished. We've got um, oh no 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 this is this is that other meeting. <sighs> Man, I was looking forward to that too. Um, well, that's awkward. All I'm ready for is the construction. How many of you have been in the middle of a construction project before? How many of you hoped it just went on and on and on forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever? Yeah. All right, well, let's have a word of prayer and we'll get started this morning. Good to see you. Let's pray. God, we come to you this morning. We want to just say thank you for your goodness. Thank you, Lord, for just the fact that God, we are created in your image, and we are created to seek after and find you. We are created, Lord, to, to walk with you and allow you uh, by your Son and through the Holy Spirit to work in our lives. And I just ask you, God, to help us today. Uh, we thank you for what you've done. We thank you for getting us here, for the privilege and blessing it is to assemble together. We thank you, Lord, uh, for these teenagers, these young people, these old people. We thank you, Lord, for every person, every soul that is here and every soul that these souls will have influence in. God, I, I ask you to do a work today to help us, Lord, to have greater understanding of our place in this society, the importance of you being proclaimed and, and the freedoms that we have, and we want to praise you for that. And, and God, we just ask for your help today, be it for the Myers as he uh, preaches, be with the the singing, the congregational, the food, the fellowship, Lord, all that's going to happen today, that, Father, first of all, you'd be honored and glorified, and, Lord, uh, in addition to that, that every person here would be blessed and helped and strengthened, and, Lord, that they would just uh, leave here closer to you, and, Lord, with a, a greater vision and understanding of what they can do uh, to serve you and their communities, Lord, we pray your blessing on all that's done. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Well, I want to thank you for being here this morning. Um, those that were not able to be here last night, uh, we kind of got to start off with a, a kind of an understanding of where the Constitution and stuff came from. Uh, here we are, we're at this uh, Liberty and Leadership Weekend uh, geared toward those who are young. I'm not young. Um, <clears throat> we have a Liberty Quiz going on right now. And part of the Liberty Quiz might be this. Uh, how, someone, someone guess how old I am. Someone, just take a guess. You're not going to offend me. But I don't want you to be from Temple. That's, that's rude. Although, Kaylin, Kaylin is sweet because just about a year ago, she thought I was in my 30s. So, Kaylin is my favorite person. Uh, she's the sweetest girl in our youth group by far, uh, bar none, <clears throat> including my children because they... Well, never mind. Anyone want to guess? This is this is part of the quiz. No one wants to guess. Yes, sir. 48. You know what? You're my second favorite person. <clears throat> Bailey, do you have your hand half up or no? No? Yes, ma'am. 52. You know what? Next month I'll be 52. So that's hateful and rude. <clears throat> Amen. Well, <clears throat> we... Uh, so we have two services, one this morning, one this afternoon. Uh, we have uh, some special guests coming, so it's uh, exciting. This afternoon we have a, a, a phone call that we'll be making, and I'll invite you to walk with me through that phone call. Uh, just a little bit about Brother Myers. There's some flyers back there on the table. He's got some books. I want to encourage you, uh, if you have the wherewithal uh, to get some books, I don't want to necessarily pick and choose which one, but this is a fantastic book. I've had this for a couple years, and, and uh, this would be a help to anyone that's able to read. Uh, honestly, if you're, if you're seven and able to read, you can read this book and get some things out of it. I'd encourage you to read it again when you're a little bit older, but uh, I want to ask a, a question here. Uh, would you raise your hand if you're 17 and older? 17 and older, raise your hand. Uh, 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 yep, <clears throat> raise your hand. Okay. So everyone with your hand up, I want to, you can put your hands down. If you raised your hand, uh, you, are, you are expected to vote in the next election, okay? You, you need to get registered to vote and all that stuff. I get that. Uh, but uh, just like we learned last night, God ordained three institutions. He ordained the institution of government. He gave, there was this covenant of governance that he gave, and he outlined it and all that. He ordained the family, which is defined in the Bible, by the way, 
the mom and dad and kids and grandkids and <clears throat> whatever. You can expand that out to your cousins and all that stuff. And then second cousins twice removed. And I think you have to go to Arkansas to figure all that stuff out. But um, <clears throat> so he, he ordained the institution of government, the institution of family, and the institution of church. Now, here's what most Christians do. We think the institution of family is important and the institution of church is important, but the institution of government is not important. <clears throat> I wonder why we think that way. I, I think I can tell you two, two reasons, really just one, but, but it happened in two ways. Our heart and mind gets deceived by the lies of the devil that it doesn't matter. Or even in some circles, some, some preachers think that it's just sinful to even talk about the government. But God ordained three institutions, the government, the church, and the family. So why, what right do I, as one of his children, have to decide that one of his institutions isn't important? I mean, it's kind of weird, right? So, so kind of what, one of the things we learned last night was that God, we're created in his image and for a purpose, and that first purpose is to seek after him. He gave us three institutions, that being uh, the government, the family, and the church, and all three of them are vitally important in his eternal work, all three of them. Now, one of the reasons that we, as a nation, are getting, um, we might say, worse and worse and worse, we're falling into to worse morality and ethical junk, and right now we have legislators, none of whom are doing their job that I can tell. Uh, one side wants to impeach the president. The other side wants to impeach the Speaker of the House. Well, who's legislating? That's my question. So, so we should take a vote. Let's just fire all of them. All, all in favor, say amen and start over. But uh, we can't do that. But there is a process that's coming very soon. It's called an election. And if you're old enough to vote, you should vote. You should vote. Now, in order to do that effectively, you need to kind of know some things. You don't have to know everything. But, you know, know some things and... In a discussion with a guy, um, <clears throat> he doesn't like one candidate personally. So, um, what's your name? John. So, I don't like John. John, Sean, Sean, okay. <clears throat> oh, don't laugh at old people. Man, that's terrible. So, I don't like Sean. Sean's running for house, whatever. I don't like him. But ideologically, we agree 100%. But I'm going to vote for, what's your name? Jordan? Whew, yes, he did it. I'm going to vote for Jordan, even though he's diametrically opposed to everything I believe. But I don't like Sean, so nanny, 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 I'm going to take my ball and run home. Well, that's fine and dandy if we're talking about school stuff, but guess what? We're talking about killing babies, right? We're talking about taking our freedoms away, increasing our taxes. We're talking about uh, things that are, are simply right and wrong and so you you need to at least be educated on that part um you know i'll just help you out god is not for killing babies i'm just going to tell you that he's not for that he's he's again it because every life is precious in his eyes you know what my bible says now this is a conversation it's hard to be had because of whatever i i shout and scream and holler amen to those who say life begins at conception but biblically, it actually begins before conception. Before I formed you in the belly, I knew you. That's a hard conversation to have with someone out, out in the street. So I agree with, with them that say that life begins at conception. But we know biblically it begins a little bit before that and, and uh, whatever. So I'm glad you're here. Welcome to Temple Baptist Church. We've got a, a good thing coming this morning, uh, the good lunch, some fellowship, We'll go outside and eat and just hang out for a little bit and then come back in uh, and finish the afternoon part of the service. So, <clears throat> Brother Myers um, has a ministry. So, here's just some things that I, I want to encourage you to, to plug away in your phone or your mind or something. Uh, but freedomfocus.us is Brother Myers' website. And uh, there's some phenomenal content on there. From there, you can link. His son, Daniel Myers, has... Um, a website. It's Freedomist. Now, you've heard of racist. You've heard of all that stuff. He's a freedomist. And uh, so, freedomist.us. Okay. And uh, he, on that content, there's a lot of short videos, some longer videos. I just saw one the other day. It was like 23 minutes long or whatever. He interviews people. He talks about stuff. 
And then he's got um, a thing. What's that called? The, the video blog thing. What's that called? Modern Conservative Thinking. Um, and in that, he interviews all kinds of people. But uh, Daniel Myers, we're working with him and, and uh, Jed Duggar to come uh, at another meeting like this uh, here in a few months. Uh, probably right now we're looking at February, but we'll figure that out um, <clears throat> between now and then. It's harder to get these young folks because they're so busy. Uh, once you get old, you're not nearly as busy, right? Who's old, right? Yeah, I think it gets worse. Um, <clears throat> so there's books on the table. I want to encourage you to take, uh, take advantage of that if you can. Uh, some phenomenal books. There's one back there, something about the word miracle. Do you remember the name of that book? Miracles something or other. Anyways, um, I got that book yesterday. And the reason I got that book is because over the years I've preached probably three-fourths of those stories. Just how the hand of God was in the formation of our, the Revolutionary War, our war for independence. There is no way physically, militarily, rationally that we could ever win. The 13 fledgling states with a few muskets and sticks, there's no way that we could beat the British Armada, the British Army, the British Navy. There's no way. And yet, because of the hand of God, we did win independence. And you know, uh, here's some things that people don't know about. Uh, do you know one of the very first votes that the U.S. House of Representatives made? They voted to print 250,000 Bibles because it was their goal, ultimately, to have a Bible in every home of the citizens of the, the colonies, the United States at the time. That was one of the votes that they made, to print 250,000 Bibles. That was paid for, essentially, by our tax dollars. Now, guess what our tax dollars are doing? Our tax dollars are paying the ACLU and all this other stuff to go to court to say, you can't take your Bible to the, to the schoolhouse. You can't take your Bible here and there. Legally, we still can, so don't be, don't be scared off with that. But our tax dollars that once went to the printing of the, of the Bible now goes to the, try to, to the eradication of the Bible. We, we are, we're on a downward trend, but you can change that. And so this weekend, this today, I wanna, I wanna, I'm praying that God will help you to see some things, to get excited, to get, uh, maybe politics isn't your thing, I get that. But here's the thing, God founded three institutions, the government, the family, and the church. And so it may not be your thing, I get that, but I want you to take it to heart and to understand that it's important to God the way that we're governed. And we do get what we deserve in that sense, you know, maybe we have bad government, well guess what, we elected them. Uh, there's an awful lot of uh, immorality and godlessness in our streets and Christians have been convinced that we need to be silent. I want to tell you we still have a right to go out and proclaim the truth. To preach the gospel, to share the gospel, to take gospel tracts to people, to invite folks to church. We still have those freedoms and liberties. And so I want to encourage you to take advantage of that and let God use you in that way. <clears throat> so right now, we are going to stand together and sing the national anthem. Okay. <clears throat> and we're going to sing two verses. It's found on page 131. So invite you to take your hymnal there if you need it for that second verse. But... The second verse is the second verse is important. And and guess what? Francis Scott Key that wrote the first verse wrote the second verse. You know why? Because that's what he believed. So pay attention to that second verse and let's sing that out together.
All right, we're getting some folks in here. It's always exciting um, <clears throat> to meet with, to be around our uh, elected officials. They serve a capacity that uh, for some, I, I'm telling you, they, they go into a battle. It really is a battle. We're far removed from it. I think as teenagers, you know, I, when I was a teenager, we talked a whole lot more about it. Of course, back in those dark ages, back in the 1900s, we had a thing called civics class. Uh, everyone had to have it. And then it turned into social studies. And he, Brother Darren's going to talk about that today, uh, the rise of socialism in our schools and our nation and all that stuff. But we had civics class, and it taught us how to be a good citizen, how to understand the workings of the government. There was even these things on public broadcasting system. How many of you remember those things about the bill? Remember, and it would go through and float, and then they'd, they'd have, uh, you know, the electric company would teach all this stuff about how the government worked and all that. Uh, my family, we've been to D.C. several times and been in the House chambers and the Senate chambers and, and uh, you know, just seen some things happen. It's pretty, pretty neat. Uh, many, some of our students have been to the state capitol and worked as pages and done some of those things. We try to get them involved as possible while we're teaching them math and English and science and all that other stuff. Um, because here's the thing, it is important. It's one of the three things that God founded, government, family, and church. Those are the three things that he founded. And <clears throat> so we have Brother Ben, and uh, he's going to bring a, a, a couple friends up here with him. Um, so we have uh, two, two elected officials, well, three, Brother Ben. Uh, so we have Nick Hoheisel, who's a state representative from District 97, which is southwest Wichita. And then we have Susan Humphreys, who's from the 99th district and and uh, just wanted these, these folks to share a little bit with you just uh, just for a few minutes I appreciate you all coming I uh, want to thank you for your work and, and just popping by I know there's a lot going on just so you know there's an awful lot going on today the Sedgwick County Republican Party is doing about 12 different things and and uh, just uh, stuff going on so I want to thank you guys for coming uh, very very much and just uh, give you a couple minutes uh, brother Ben we'll start with him brother Ben's a city council member from Park City just north of here a little bit and then uh, you can just work your way down right there. Well, yeah, I guess I'm stuck now. Um, so, city government, local government, um, whether it's city or county, is really the, the, the place of government that is closest to the people. Those are the decisions that are made on a daily, well, we make them every other week in, in uh, Park City when we have our city council meetings, some do it weekly. But those are the places that make the biggest impact on your day-to-day -day life. This is where we make the rules or the ordinances or the laws that really affect what you can and can't do on a daily basis. Now, I understand, and, and they would probably can give a lot more as to what the state does and, and then also the federal government on, on the laws that they craft and what they do. But a lot of what takes place in, in your daily lives happens at the city level, whether it's city councils, whether it's county commissions, or whether it's school boards, and that's another thing. And I would say this, I'm gonna make a plug, we are just three weeks away from our city elections here in, said, well, in the state of Kansas, so it doesn't matter where you're at. If you are 18 and registered to vote, make sure to get out and vote for those city elections because they make a big, big difference. Um, I, in Park City, we have nobody opposed on the city side, but we do have school board uh, that's going on up there. So learn about those candidates there. Uh, the school boards, though you say, well, we are homeschooled or we're private or whatever the case might be, those leaders still make an impact right. on how the tax dollars that you are sp sending them get spent. Um, and so I actually just had a conversation with one candidate. I said, I'm from Park City. I'm in the Valley Center School District. And in my time up here, no one has ever reached out to me um, from Valley Center School District. No school board member, no one has ever came to Park City. And we send a third of our city citizens, or a third of our uh, school, city district, goes to Valley Center. It's good to have representation. I mean, that's kind of what we fought a war over, um, was representation. So these things become important. Get to know these candidates, get involved. Um, one of the things when it comes down to making choices, making decisions um, that I use, this is general, my rule of thumb, um, is not so much what happens tomorrow. Because I know the men and women that I serve with on the city council. We have overall a very good working relationship. Sometimes it gets a little heated and that's fine. But we have a good relationship, and, and I understand their pe th those individuals. I understand what their thoughts are, what their processes are when they're making decisions and votes. And that's all fine and dandy. My concern when I'm looking at making votes on, that are going to affect everybody uh, is what's going to happen down the road when I'm not in city council 
on, on city council, or when these men and women aren't on city council, when we have new individuals that have come on and their viewpoints differ and they change, and, and how are they going to interpret what we do as a city, as a school board, as a county commission, as a state legislator, as a federal legislator? How, what are their, what are, how are they going to interpret that? And I'll give you one quick ex, um, example. Uh, shortly after September 11th, uh, Congress drew up a law, and it's become quite controversial, but it, it, it's known as the Patriot Act. The Patriot Act was used in many different ways to try to help prevent further terrorist uh, activities. In our country, we used it in, in, in multiple different ways, and it passed Congress overwhelmingly. Was it because of, of everything that had just happened? Possibly so, but it, it sought to try to make sure that we are doing our best to keep terrorist activity down. The problem happens is after the Bush administration left office, we had a new president come into office and a new Congress come into office. People who weren't around in making these laws when September 11th happened. So a whole new perspective, a whole new worldview took office and came into power. And what we saw shortly after 2008, 2009 when the Obama administration and when these, this new Congress came in is we saw a drastic change in how the Patriot Act was applied to surveillance and to people's privacy and protections. And so what you had was a law that might have been intended for good in its present time be misused drastically when somebody else came into power. And now we're still fighting that battle over privacy and issues like that. I'm not saying one way or another on the Patriot Act whether it was great, I'm just, what I'm simply saying is this, is that when we make decisions as, as elected officials, we have to look down the road. I might view this as an okay thing right now, but what, and again, this is said, what one generation does in moderation, the next will do in excess. And so having that conscience to say, or that, that thinking that says, okay, this is, uh, and we deal with little things, like we're dealing with fireworks. I mean, okay, I, I like fireworks, so I voted against the ordinance, and which is kind of, and uh, we lost five to four on that, but, uh, you know, and, and some other things, some construction issues, things that really affect the day-to-day -day life. My point simply is this, is that w the way I view things is we have to look down the road. I'm not always going to be here. One day it could be you leading the city uh, or, or, or casting votes uh, that affect people's lives. A and so when you're there, what am I setting this next generation up for to make decisions on? A and that's really how I view things. Now, I will say this, it's important to get involved on the city side, on the local side there. We need great legislators. Nick and Susan do a phenomenal job representing us in Topeka. I've uh, known them both for many years, and they're great people. And they serve with the heart of looking forward down the road. So I appreciate all of them, and I'll let them talk about that more. But um, getting involved in these local races, um, whether you're campaigning for them, finding candidates that, that, that match your worldview, uh, getting involved, helping those candidates win, and then keeping them accountable. One of the things that I love but also don't like is I've been on council for almost two years now. And I, I do a monthly coffee thing. I send out newsletters. I went door to door and everything. All this fun stuff that you do for campaigning. I love this, but I don't. I can go to the grocery store in town and nobody has a clue who I am. And I love that because that means I'm not getting hassled about some decision that the city just made. That's the fun side. The bad side, though, is this, is that I feel like I should get spoken to. Because these are issues that are affecting these individuals. And it's not that I want them to care who I am. It's not that. It's just simply this. I want them to be able to have that understanding of who their p electeds are to know that they can have that conversation with them wherever they're at. It wasn't until two weeks ago that I got my first phone call from someone about an issue. These other people are like, my phone's blowing up. My, you know, whatever the case might be, I don't get that very often. And I enjoy it because that means I can go places in peace and, and not, but at the same point, I feel it's important that us as individuals hold our electeds uh, accountable. Emails, phone calls, seeing them, all those things like that. So get involved. And as you get older, consider running. Um, someone said this, evil thrives when good men do nothing. Why don't we have people involved in government? It's because the nastiness of our political culture today. Because now we see, and we see it here in Wichita, that you can make a tax against an individual with no, no truth to it whatsoever and destroy someone's character and their person falsely 
And so it takes a lot of guts to put yourself out there knowing that now I don't even have to do anything wrong. I can just be thrown under the bus. But we need good young men and women, women being involved in the political process. Get involved. Find out who your elected officials are. Find out who your, your city ones, your state ones are. Help them. Get to know them. Uh, encourage them when there's a vote that matters that you don't agree with or you do agree with. Give them that motivation to keep going. So that's all I have to say. Okay, thank you so much. So let me just ask Nick a question. So I might talk a little bit about history. If you are going to sort of talk about what's going on right now in state government, how about sure. that? Okay, because I didn't know exactly what the form, what we were going to be doing. I did prepare a few just thoughts. And I'll tell you, my thoughts are going to be a little bit more, I mean, it's awesome I get to speak at a church because I get to really incorporate my faith a little bit more than just if I was speaking at um, the Rotary Club or something. So first of all, I just want to say, I love what you've done to the building. I was part of Heartland Community Church when we bought this. It was a country club. I don't know if you guys know this building used to be a country club. There were tennis courts right out there. There used to be a swimming pool. And um, so we kind of redid it. I know every square inch of this building. And is the basement still really creepy like it used to be? <laughs> OK. Um, so anyway, I, I love what you've done. It looks awesome. So I just want to say, um, I want to talk about God and government. And so God, first of all, where do we, everything we know, the truth we know about God, we get from the Bible, exactly. That is our foundation. And the Bible speaks about government. And I, I really just, if I can, I want to read just one verse. But there are many, many, many verses that talk about that God ordains government. Um, I'm going to read 2 Chronicles 20, verse 6. O oh Lord, God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? You rule over all kingdoms of the nations. In your hand are power and might, so that none is able to withstand you. So God is in control. He is the one that ordains the governments. And there's a lot of verses about that. Okay, so that's, we know where government comes from. Now, talking about our government, where do we get our foundations of our government here in the United States? Y'all know what documents? The Constitution and also the Declaration of Independence, exactly. What do they say? They say all men, all mankind, will say all mankind are created equal. That is final. You can't change that. They are endowed with inalienable rights. So inalienable means that they come from God. We don't get our rights from the government. The Bill of Rights are not how we get our rights. God is how we get our rights. So they, we are endowed with inalienable rights. That is final. And government receives its power from the governed. That is final. And so anything that's trying to change that, they might say, we're progressive we want to change those things, but those things are final. And if we want to change those things, it is regressive. It means those things are not true. So I just want to lay that foundation of God in the Bible. He ordains government, and government, our rights come from God. It's a circle. So just um, what should we do with that in mind? And I would really encourage you all to pray for your leaders. I mean, uh, 1 Timothy 2, verses 1 through 2, really exhorts us to pray for the leaders. So please do that. We so want you all to pray. Be aware and understand history. I don't know where you all go to school, or I don't know your situation. If it's public school, home school, private school, whatever it is, be aware and understand our history. Don't be taken in by this change, that they're trying to change our history, and especially the history of our country. We cannot be disconnected from the realities of our history, and that takes an effort. Replacing God, our founders, God is the basis. Replacing God with government 
is what leftists want to do today. That's the progressive movement. And it continues. It continues on. And so I would just say be aware of current events. Your religious freedom rights are under attack right now. And so be aware. If we're not aware, if we don't understand what's happening, then we're not going to be able to fight it. We have to think critically. Vote. As soon as you all turn 18, I hope that you're going to go register to vote. It's so important. Talk about these things. I mean, that might be the hardest thing I'm saying up here. Talk about these things with your friends and your neighbors. Be willing to say, where do you get that idea? And why do you think the Constitution is a living document? Because I believe that our founders meant this, whatever, when they wrote the Constitution. Be willing to talk about it. And then, as uh, uh, Ben said, run for office. Be willing to put yourself out there. And there are people that will help you do that. So be willing to run because the only way, if we don't stand on the foundation of the Bible and our founding documents, the only way to go is backwards. We're engaged in a battle for the soul of America, I believe. And um, the fundamental question is, are we going to put our trust in God? Are we going to put our trust in government? So we need to put our trust in God by praying for those in government. Proverbs 14.34 says, Righteousness exalts a nation but sin is a reproach to any people. So how our nation is judged in righteousness is what's going to make all the difference. So um, don't reject the dictates of Scripture. Keep standing on that. And the last thing I want to say is that we're all blessed. I mean, yes, we have problems. Yes, we have issues. But the reason we're blessed is so that we can be a blessing to others. And so these, you know, we all are dressed here today. We probably all had a good breakfast this morning. We all have blessings that we can thank God for. And God wants us to turn around to be a blessing to other people. So I would just say, go be a blessing. And so thank you for letting me make this a really um, more spiritual talk. But I so appreciate being able to talk to people in church. And I think, Nick, I don't know, we didn't, I don't know exactly what Nick's going to say, but he'll probably bring it down to a more practical level, which would be awesome. So, Nick, go ahead. Thank you all. Thank you, Susan. Uh, Susan's great, by the way. Uh, big help in Topeka. Just getting to know her these last year and a half working together. We've done some great things. Uh, my name is Nick Oizo. I do represent the 97th District in Southwest Wichita. Um, it's good to see so many younger people here today because I'm younger as well. I'm one of the youngest in Topeka. Uh, I believe the fifth youngest, actually. I'm 33 years old, um, which kind of seems like an accomplishment till you think of the fact that Thomas Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence at 33 years old. So I haven't really done anything with my life yet. Um, so the reason I wanted to talk today, and, and he, he alluded to it earlier, today is a very busy day, but, but when Ben reached out and asked me to speak and I saw that it was gonna be younger people here, I definitely wanted to make some time and come and talk to you guys because we see it on the left today. Ronald Reagan's quote of freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. And we are seeing that right now on the left. They have forgotten what freedom is. It's all about socialism. It's about how far their left you guys can go. And it's our generation, it's my generation that is guilty of this. And that's because we will not stand up and be leaders and say, no, we believe in the First Amendment, freedom of speech, freedom to worship who we please, Second Amendment, freedom of bear arms. We believe in these constitutional rights. Um, and the left doesn't. And it's going farther and farther to the left. And my generation on the left, they're stepping up. You see it with AOC. They're stepping up. They're being leaders. That's why I decided to run for office, because I want to step up and be a leader. I want to step up and have a voice in this today, um, because it is time for my generation to lead. And it is time for your guys' generation to lead as well. Um, I'll echo Susan and, and Ben on getting involved. How I first got involved is I joined my neighborhood uh, organization. That's all I did. Then joined a city council advisory board. That's all I did. Just simple. One night a month, that's all you guys have to commit and a stepping stone. From there, you move up. Um, so I ran for office. I won, didn't know what I was getting into. Uh, got thrown into the fire in Topeka. We're constantly having to put out fires left and right, whether it's budget issues, school funding issues, 
uh, pro-life issues. Last week, I was just up in Topeka on the interim committee on uh, a right to life amendment that we're trying to pass out. Uh, just basically saying that the Kansas Con Constitution does not give you a right to an abortion. Um, and I've received a lot of emails from a lot of different people, outside organizations about this. Some of them good, some of them nasty, as Ben alluded to earlier, that's just politics. Um, ben is lucky he doesn't get recognized when he goes to the grocery store out. I unfortunately do. Most of the time it's good, some of the time it's bad. That just comes with the office. So, um, you know, those are the kind of issues we face in Topeka. Uh, constantly, every day, I get emails from transportation issues to energy issues. Um, and Ben talks about looking long term, and I want to look long term because I'm still young. I have the rest of my life ahead of me. I have my kids' life ahead of me. I have your guys' lives ahead of me. And so when I'm constantly thinking about policy, I'm thinking about long term ramifications of that policy. Um, some individuals up there, you know, the average age, I believe, in the legislator uh, this year is about 58 years old. So there's not many people like me up there. And, and no offense, I, and I love Susan. No offense, I hope Susan stays for as long as she wants. But there are times where I wish there were some younger people up there my age that look at it kind of from my perspective. And that's why I want more people to be involved. Get involved, find candidates to run, find candidates to help. If you can't find candidates, run yourself. If you find a candidate, you like them, you help them get elected, and they don't serve the way you feel they should be serving, run against them. Once you're 18 years old, register to vote. Get involved. I always need door knockers. Young door knockers are the best door knockers. My son is 12 years old, he was the best door knocker I had. It's because you guys have so much energy. You know, I, I, I can get 40, 50 year old door knockers out there and they just don't have that energy and that smile as, as younger Kansans do. So get involved, find candidates, find a issue you care about, that you're passionate about, that you want to fix, that you want to help. There's so many opportunities out there for you guys to get involved and we need you guys that believe in the Constitution to step up and be leaders because the left is winning right now. The left, my generation of the left is winning right now. We are losing. And, and we'll see it in 2020. We'll see it in 2022. It's just going to keep going on, and they're going further and further to the left with the squad and AOC and all that. So it's time for us to step up. People that we care about the Constitution, step up. Let's be leaders, and let's show the nation that we still believe in the Constitution. We still believe in the Bill of Rights. So thank you, guys. Like I said, I could always use door knockers if you guys ever want to come out and knock for me. I, I pay good in pizza. So. Well, I'd, I'd get up, but I'm really tired because I'm 51 years old. Hey, that and, works. Uh, hey, you can come <laughs> knock doors too. That, uh, all right. Um, I, I have one more thing, so I'm going to ask uh, Kimber if she'll come up here. So Nick was talking about ways to get involved. This is one of the things that we've done. Uh, we've we've walked and knocked and all that stuff. We've worked on different campaigns. Um, so here, you, you want to say, well, I just, you know, I'm, I'm 14. I don't know how I can get involved. My my girls sang for two plus hours at a Republican County Christmas party. Uh, they just sang over there by the piano. It was awesome. And then drunk Santa Claus came in, and Ben came over and told them to sing louder. Well, drunk Santa Claus came in. I'm like, well, this is supposed to be part of the important. So I went over, told them to sing quieter, and they said, well, Ben said sing louder. I'm like, well, praise the Lord, sing louder then. And so <laughs> they just started yelling, and, and people migrated toward the piano and away from drunk Santa Claus. And I, I mean, he was drunk, wasn't he? He was. What he party was, was this? <clears throat> what party was this? Just last December, yeah. Anyway, so you can get involved. Now, uh, one of the things that I try to encourage some of our young folks to do is, is find something that you're passionate about. Find something. Because I promise you, every single one of you have something that you're passionate about. Now, it may be uh, some sport or something. I would encourage you to, to kind of rethink that because that's not going to help anyone later on down the road. It may help you physically and help you learn to play team sports, but I'm telling you, find something that you can be passionate about that, that, that matters and can make a difference. 
find something. So uh, my daughter and I, have been, she's been asking a bunch of questions and whatever. And so I've asked her just to take a, about three or four minutes and share with you that's for something that's passionate on her, her heart. So, Kimber, you come get this microphone and, and, uh, and you, you, just, you just talk for a minute. It, don't go too far away yet. This is only going to take a couple minutes. Um, my name is Kimber Howerton. I am 15, and a few years ago, I became really passionate about abortion. And I, I'm not a big fan of kids. I don't like babies or kids, but I, I just it really, I, I hate abortion with all, all of my being. I hate it. So um, a lot of people these days have been saying that a baby or an embryo, fetus, or tissue, as they say, isn't a human until it's born, or until the heart, the, uh, sorry. <laughs> or until its heart beats. Naturally, I strongly disagree. First, I'd like to look at the word human, and I'm pretty sure that most people don't go home and just randomly look up the meaning to the word human, but I got curious one day. So human, one of the definitions that I found is pertaining to having characteristics of or having the same nature of people. Pretty much what they're saying is if you look like a human, you are a human. Um, so now while babies don't always look like babies, they do have the same basic structure as a human. They're um, their hands, their feet, their head, and develop, developing organs, and so on. But if the baby isn't a human, then what is it? We know that it is alive because of the DNA developed at conception, so that means it isn't a blob. So what all has DNA? Humans, plants, and animals are a few things that do have DNA. And I'm pretty sure I wasn't an animal or a plant before I was born. So that leaves us with humans. So now that we know that a baby is a human, let's talk about its unalienable rights. The Declaration of Independence says that we the people, by definition that includes unborn babies too, hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So when a woman says it's my body, my choice, they are actually dead wrong. When someone aborts a baby, they are taking away that child's unalienable rights and their right to life. In 2018, 18% of pregnancies, not including miscarriages, were abortions. And since 1973, when abortion was legalized, there have been over 60 million abortions. That is too many deaths. But I can say without a doubt in my mind that every one of those babies are in heaven. And before, I'll go, before I go, I'll leave you with one verse. Psalms 139, 14 says, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that, and that my soul knoweth right well. So she's actually got to talk to people. She has a now. Now her next passion, she just told me, is the Second Amendment. So, um, <clears throat> so find something. And you know what? She's talked to elected officials. She's talked to people from D.C. She's talked to people about abortion over the last few years because it just made its way into conversation. You know why it made its way into conversation? Because it's always policy. Always. It's always an argument in the houses of government, be it local, state, federal. It's always policy, so it's always present, and it's always important. You find something that you're passionate about, write a letter to your elected official. If you don't know, if you don't know one, write, write one to Nick. <laughs> write one to Ben. He's lonely. <laughs> write one to Susan. I, I mean, I, I, wanna, I want us all to thank these folks for being here, for coming out in the midst of a busy, busy day. And so let's just give them a hand and thank them for coming. <laughs> for their hard work and as they... Uh, uh, go ahead. It's a private conversation. <clears throat> yeah, the thing about November 8th, is it in there? Okay. Um, all right. Well, let's pray for them real quick and let them go. Lord, we love you and we thank you for our, our elected officials. We thank you for those who serve in our government and our uh, police force and all of that, Lord, those that, that serve to, to carry out your ordinance of governance. We pray, God, your protection, your wisdom, your grace, your help upon all of them, uh, Lord, from the White House down to, to our state house and into our cities. And Lord, I just ask you to bless them. Thank you, Lord, for Nick and Susan and their work. And I pray that, Lord, your, your mighty 
blessing and power be with them. God, just protect them from the voices that want to draw them uh, away or, or silence them. God, help them to speak out and speak truth. And God, just uh, give them boldness. We thank you for being in his work in Park City and in Sedgwick County. We ask God that you just bless them. And Lord, be with the, all the work that's going on today. That Lord, you'd put your hand on it and bless it in a mighty way. We thank you, thank you for these folks. We love you in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Thank you guys so much for coming. Appreciate your time and, and your words. And that, uh, uh, again, they are busy today. And you, We'd love for you to stay. We got lunch if you want to stay. Brother Myers is going to be talking about socialism and how it's crept into our government and all that stuff. Um, so right now we have a special. My girls are going to come. And then uh, right after that we'll introduce Brother Myers and we'll get going with the first, uh, the, the first presentation. And I'm excited about this one on socialism uh, because I think the truth is, even as Nick was saying, I think a lot of times we're blinded to it, and, and it keeps getting presented more and more profoundly in the younger ages, uh, those in our high schools and colleges. It is the um, ideology of the day, I guess we can say. And so we are literally fighting against what is basically rational and normal, as stated by some. So... These ladies are going to sing, and then uh, Brother Myers, you come, and uh, we get this thing started, and I'll ramble till you get it going. Amen.
That's a blessing. Brother Myers, you come. Uh, appreciate our elected officials being here. We had, uh, you know, one of the things I think we, we need to be thankful for, just the fact that, you know, we can have some of these folks and, and they can come and they can they can share Bible verses. They can talk. Earlier in the year or last year, I don't remember when it was. I think it was earlier this year. Um, we had a Kansans for Israel rally on the state capitol. And uh, we had, if I remember correctly, I think we had at one time 23 elected officials up in front there. There was 13 different ones that spoke. And the, speak, uh, the, um, the president of the Senate uh, of the Kansas State House it got up, and I'm telling you what, she she shared her views biblically. It, it was a it was a remarkable presence that we saw there because all these folks talked about how important God was in the state house, and and I, I think as normal citizens we don't think about that kind of stuff. That it is a spiritual battle. Just like you at school or at wherever, the spiritual battle in the houses that that vote for policy is really more profound than it is in most other places. I think sometimes our schools and stuff get an awful lot of that, but uh, boy, we need to pray for our leaders. We need to be thankful for them, and uh, we need to just, uh, you know, I mean, we're told to in Scripture anyways, but we need to pray for them. Uh, because they really are working on our behalf. So, Brother Myers, if you're ready, you come. Appreciate you and the work that God's given you to do, and uh, just the blessing that last night was. Looking forward uh, to what God has for us today. Uh, I encourage you to give give God your attention and uh, let Him speak to you. All right, praise the Lord. Glad to be here on a Saturday morning. How many of you excited about being here on Saturday? Good. I'm glad to hear that. Um, let's stand if you would. I'm just going to ask how many of you are younger than seventh grade? So you're sixth grade or under, just raise your hand so I can get a feel for who's here today. Okay. How many seventh graders do we have? All right. Good, good. I remember that year myself. Uh, how many eighth graders? Good. Ninth grade. Okay. 10th. Wow. Good number of those. 11th grade. Good. And seniors. All right. How many are in college? Anybody like that? We got one back there. Good. Well, praise the Lord. Every one of you are important, and we're going to uh, focus on the wonder of the individual here in just a minute. But every, every one of you are valuable, and I just want to encourage you to pursue God's will for your life, whatever that is. There's nothing more exciting than just doing the will of God. And I can say that after all these years of ministry, I surrendered my life when I was probably 13 years old to just fully sell out, Lord, whatever it is you want. I'm tired of playing games. I just want to live my life for you. And that was the most important decision I ever made. I've never regretted it after all these years, and it truly has been an exciting adventure. So I encourage you to do the same thing. All right, let's pray, and then we'll get started. Thank you, Lord, for the day. Thank you for everyone that's here, and I pray that you would work in our hearts and lives Thank you for the Bible, for the truth. Thank you that we have a solid foundation. Thank you for history, that we can look back and see what has worked and what hasn't worked, and the nature of man and nature of governments. And I just pray that you'd open our hearts and minds today that we would truly learn and grow, and we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated, and I'm not going to try to uh, go too awfully long. In fact, do we have an expected time for this to be done, or... Okay, all right, good. Yeah, good, all right. Well, I heard about the country boy that uh, flew on an airplane for the first time. And they got out there over the, way up in the air, out over the middle of America. And the pilot came on board and said, or on the intercom and said, we've just lost an engine, but I'm telling you, it's fine. We've got three more. The only problem is it's going to delay us an hour, but we'll get there. Oh, whoa, wow, that's, that's pretty amazing. It wasn't long uh, that the plane kind of shook again, and the guy got back on the intercom and said, <clears throat> please don't be alarmed, folks, but we've lost a second engine. It's okay, though. It'll just delay us one more hour, but we will get there. Wow, that's interesting. So next thing you know, another engine went out. He could feel it, and the guy got back on the intercom. 
I'm sorry to announce that we've lost one more engine, but it's okay. We've got, we've got that last engine. We're going to get in. It's going to delay us another hour, but we will get there. That country boy nudged the guy next to him and said, man, if we lose that last engine, we'll be up here all day. <laughs> so <clears throat> I don't want to be up here all day. I want to eat lunch, and we'll get right to that. So uh, I will say this quickly, though, we, just a couple things. Our son, Daniel, who has traveled with us for a long time, his picture's on that uh, banner back there. He's 22, and he just gave his life to the Lord years ago and said, hey, whatever you want me to do. And, and he has a real love for America and freedom and, and the truth. So uh, the Lord's used him in a lot of ways. He sang with us for quite a while and does uh, audio and video kind of things. So a lot of the things online that we have, uh, Daniel videoed those and edited them. I'm saying that in part just because I want you to realize you can do something. So you may not be a preacher, a teacher, a singer, but you know maybe uh, God can use you and your special talents and gifts and uh, make a difference. And so Daniel is... Uh, one of the things he has done is freedomist.us, so I just want to encourage you to go to that, check it out. And the other thing was the uh, modern conservative thinking, and if you go to uh, iTunes store podcast, you know, or what's the other one? Uh, uh, man, I can't even think of it. It's the uh, not Apple version, SoundCloud or something, or whatever they are. You kids probably know. Anyway, it's uh, just look up the podcast. Modern Conservative Thinking, I think it comes out every two weeks, and uh, he, they interview people, and, it's, and they use humor, and they have a, a, a news recap that just kind of talks about, here's what's been going on the last couple of weeks. And so it's just a way for you to just kind of connect and have fun while you're driving, listening to that thing, and uh, you know, stay informed, because that's huge. We've got to have educated people or our country will not work. And the founders really believe that. Education is critical. So anyway, um, he's got a place on that website there where you can uh, get this little booklet, Three Ways to Stand for Freedom Today. So I would encourage all young people. This is aimed at uh, kids that are 15 to 25 years old. So um, it'd be an encouragement to you if you check that out. We're going to go past that for right now and get to socialism. Let me just say we do have several things on the table back there. And uh, we have a set of posters that we put together a long time ago. And it's kind of interesting. So this is, there's 15 posters in here. These are all considered founding fathers. And we've got their name and what they did, signer of the Constitution, ratifier of the Constitution, wrote 51 of the 85 Federalist Papers. This happens to be Alexander Hamilton. But then it also has their faith quotes. And so these are things they said about Jesus Christ or the Bible or prayer. And there's a set of posters back there. We've, these are actually in several public schools now because some of our uh, churches had public school teachers and they purchased the, uh, the posters and put them up in their school. And then they send us a picture later, you know, here's what, here's what my classroom looks like now. They got, you know, 15 of these posters. So anyway, that'll be a blessing. We really designed them for Christian school or, or even junior church or something like that, you know, just to have those things up there. But uh, honestly, every one of these books are good. This is my favorite because it's direct quotes from the founders. And these, well, actually, it's pilgrims, uh, presidents, founders, court cases, anything that has to do with prayer, faith, the Bible, Jesus Christ, morals, you know, living right. And uh, it's hard to argue with the direct quotes, you know. So we've got a lot of people saying, oh, those guys weren't Christians, and they didn't want a Christian government, and they didn't want Christian principles. It's hard to argue with their direct quotes. So read this. It'll encourage you. It's pretty amazing. It's got the story in there about how when George Washington was in the Battle of Monongahela and he got shot four times but never got hit, he had four bullet holes in his coat, two bullet holes in his hat, uh, two horses shot out from under him. So, I mean, they'd kill his horse, he'd get on another horse. They'd kill it, he'd get on another horse. And he said after that, he wrote a letter to his brother and said, God had to have saved me because there is no other explanation. 
Every other officer was shot that day. But for some reason, I was preserved. And the Indian chief went on to say, that guy's going to be a leader of a great nation. <laughs> it's just pretty amazing stuff. And that kind of stuff's in here. So I just want to encourage you, uh, check it out. This is a set of DVDs of, of presentations that we've been doing for the last several years. And then here's Baptist Patriots and the American Revolution. It's a real small book, but it's really cool because it takes people like us that influenced Je uh, Madison and Jefferson and, and others. And America is America today like it is because of people like this that cared, that got involved. And uh, so that will inspire you. Uh, Brother Gibbs wrote a couple of really good books here. Here's the Miracles in American History. Here's the one on Change to Chains. Every one of these are on the table because they're good and they have helped us. So we're not just trying to sell books. We're really trying to help people. And if you go home with this stuff, that encourages us because we know sooner or later you're going to read it. And once this gets into your head and into your heart, you can tell others. Here's one thing about education and educating others. You can't teach them anything that you don't know. So the first step is you got to know it. And I wasn't a big time reader when I was your age. I understand. But if you can just, if something in these books will get your attention and get down in your heart, then you can share it with others. And that's the greatest thing you can do to help preserve freedom in America, really, is educate your fellow man. So there's lots of ways to get that done. Just want to encourage you. Um, one more thing is we are doing this show in Branson. I hate to call it a show, but I don't know what else to call it. It's, it's a combination of the things that we say here and music and drama. So we'll have George Washington, Patrick Henry will give his uh, liberty or death speech. We've got the niece of William Tyndale, who was, who was uh, executed because of copying the Bible into English, translating it. And uh, she'll be giving a testimony kind of a thing. And it's real cool with the light and the fog and all that. You know, it, it'll be a, a two-hour show, you know, like, like you would see in Branson. It's at the Americana Theater right on Highway 76 across from the Presley's. And the Lord just kind of opened a door two or three years ago to where we could. We used to do these rallies outside, and there's always the weather and all kinds of elements that you got to deal with that are very unpredictable. And we thought, wouldn't it be amazing to do it in a theater where we can control the total environment? And so the Lord gave us that opportunity, and this will be our third year to do it now. And uh, if you're interested, check out, get the card, check it out. Let me say also that I'm very thankful that we got to see those elected officials today. Because there's, there's this idea that government or elected people, they're like, from another planet or something. They're like these alien people that are governing. You know, it's nobody we ever know. You know, and they're like not really human or something. That's not true. They're, it's just your neighbors. You know, they're just people. And I got a question for you this morning. If godly people don't run for office, who does that lead? ungodly. It's not that hard to figure out. So we get aggravated because of these ungodly people in government. Well, if the godly people don't run, who's going to? And I guarantee you the socialists and the left are pushing kids to run. And I've heard them. I've heard them say to young people, it doesn't matter if you know anything, just run for office. You want to make a difference? You want to, you know, change the world? Run for office. And they're encouraging their kids to run for office. If the godly don't run, who's going to run? You know, the founders, when they gave us this government, they said it's a government of the people, for the people, and by the people. And, and uh, the problem with that is if the people don't get involved, it won't work. After they wrote the Constitution, Benjamin Franklin came outside and a the lady there in Philadelphia asked him, what kind of a government have you given us, a monarchy or a republic? And he said, a republic, if you can keep it. A republic, 
is a representative government where the people are involved. We, the people, are hiring our leaders for short periods of time. But if the people don't vote, if the people don't run, it won't work. And a tyrant will always step into that vacuum. There's some people that are hungry for power because they want the control. They want to be in control of the money flow and all of that. And so if good people will not step up and fill those offices, then that leaves the power hungry and the ungodly. And then we are all upset because our country is so ungodly. You know, they're passing all this horrible legislation and this and that. Yeah, because God's people aren't involved. Now, you know, I'll just say another thing. In Romans 13, it says there are ministers of God to thee for good ministers of God? You mean elected officials or ministers of God? Uh, our leaders? The judges? The military? The law enforcement? Th they're ministers of God? That's what the Bible says. Well, I thought God only called preachers and missionaries. Well, we need to rethink that. I believe with all my heart that God calls certain people to go into the military. I've heard their own testimonies. I've heard the testimonies of several people in Congress in D.C. that stood up and said, you know, I was doing just fine with my business, or I ran a youth camp, or I did this or that, and God just started putting on my heart, you need to run for office. And the only reason I'm here is because I couldn't, I couldn't run away from it. It was a calling on my life. And I ran, and against all odds, I got it, and here I am. I've heard way too many of those stories to believe that God doesn't call people into government. If God gave us government for our good, why wouldn't he call good people into it just like he calls missionaries and pastors and, and everything else? He, he will. He, he, he does. The problem is, are we listening? Is it even on our radar? And I'm not saying everyone should run for office no more than everyone should be a pastor. You know, but is it at least on your radar that you're considering it, you know, because God can and will call good people. And uh, I just want to encourage you to think that way, you know. Uh, let's go ahead and get into this thing of socialism versus the Bible. So everybody wide awake and ready for this? Uh-huh. You could be home watching cartoons or something, or I don't know what you do these days. When I was a kid, it was Bugs Bunny, Roadrunner. And uh, we always made French toast on Saturday mornings. That was our tradition. Uh, I don't know what your tradition is on Saturdays, but uh, anyway, thank you for being here today and giving God a chance to work in your heart. All right, 1 Timothy 5, and I'm going to start with just a, a few Bible principles. If any provide not for his own, especially for those of his own house, he is denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Okay? God says, look, I gave you the family unit. I expect you, this is the particular passage he's talking about, you know, widows and making sure that the family takes care of the widows. And so parents are taking care of the kids when the kids are helpless. And then the kids take care of the parents when the parents are helpless. And that's God's system. It's a pretty good system. And he says, if you won't provide for your own, and especially for those of your own house, you've denied the faith and you're worse than an infidel. Wow. There, there's a responsibility built into life that parents are going to take care of their kids, but then someday when that family grows up, they're going to be able to help take care of the parents. You know, it's just, it's a, it's a really genius plan. And if you don't go with this plan, you're worse than an unbeliever. So God has a system of welfare, if you will. He has a system built in to where uh, we take care of each other, and it starts with the family. Okay? Here's another one, 2 Thessalonians 3.10. If any would not work, neither should he eat. Now, this is an interesting Bible principle that many would consider hate speech. Right? <laughs> Probably. What? You mean to tell me I got to work to eat? That's just not right. Well, yeah, it is right, and that's Bible. And it's common sense. So God kind of built into the system that every day you're going to get hungry. Didn't have to be that way, did it? God could have done this any way he wanted. But he decided, I want you to be hungry every day. 
In fact, most of us are hungry two or three times a day, right? We want to go to that refrigerator and find food. But sooner or later, it dawns on us, food doesn't just appear in the refrigerator. And I can't just go down to the store and take it. So what? So that means I've got to work to have income coming in so I can go to the store and buy food and put it in the refrigerator. So every day when I get up and walk over there and open that door, there's something in there to eat. And I'm going to like that. So we have motivation every day to work. Because if I don't work, the refrigerator's empty. Now, most of you, you know, maybe mom and dad are still filling the refrigerator, but the day's coming. This reality is going to dawn on you. If I don't work, there's nothing there. That's a pretty good incentive to work. And God made it that way. You realize you are a working machine. You've got a brain, eyes, hands, feet. You are designed to produce. And God expects you to produce. In fact, he says, if you won't produce, you don't even deserve to eat. So the burden's on you, right? Not somebody else. It's on you. Here's another one. Ephesians 4.28, let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may give to him that needeth. Okay, there's a lot right there, but basically he's saying stop stealing. Right? Let him that stole steal no more. Wait, what, what does stealing even mean? Well, it means taking something that belongs to someone else. Right? Thou shalt not steal. You can't have that command unless you believe in private property. What's private property? Well, that means you can own things. Wait, 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 wait. You can't tell me that you own anything. You can't tell me that this ground belongs to you. You can't own the tree. You can't own the water on your property. You can't own what's in the ground underneath that. That belongs to all of us. You know, like Native American or, or, or whatever philosophy where, you know, no, the earth is for everyone. Well, God believes in private property. Now, it all belongs to God, right? He's the creator, and he's going to end it all someday, melt with the fervent heat when he decides. But God said... You can own property while you're here. You are a steward of whatever is your possession during your time on earth. And God set it up that way because he wants you to learn all kinds of spiritual lessons. Because when you, you have to work for that property to be able to purchase it. And then you're going to steward that property in a good way or a bad way, right? You're going to give to others, and God's going to bless you for giving, or you're going to be selfish and stingy, and you're going to learn that that doesn't help anyone. And uh, so there's all kinds of spiritual lessons in this thing of private property. But here's what I want to say. Private property is a Bible principle. You can't steal it if it, act, if it belongs to everybody. So when you've earned something, and you bought it, and, and and it's yours now, is it right for someone else just to come along and take it? Absolutely not. Okay? So stop stealing. What do you do instead? You get a job, right? Let him labor. That means, man, I really want all these things, but I don't know how to get it. Well, don't think about taking it from someone. That's not an option. Well, here's what you could do. Go to work. Get a job. Save up your money. You buy it. Then he says, working with his hands the thing which is good that he may give to him that needeth. Not only does God expect you to provide for yourself and work so that you can have the things that you need and your family needs, but he wants you to work abundantly so that there's leftovers so that you can give to him that needeth. That means some people are in a bad way and they really are struggling. But if you've got enough extra, you can give to them and really be a blessing to them. I just read in Proverbs this morning, Proverbs 19, how that when you give to the poor, you're actually lending to the Lord, and God will repay you. 
Now, Proverbs is full of those kind of verses. And Jesus had a lot to say about give, and it shall be given to you, right? And give your offerings, not grudgingly or of necessity, but with a cheerful heart. Learn to be givers. So we give. We provide for others through the family, through the local church. But here's an interesting thought. Never through government. That is not a Bible principle. Look, I mean, I've been studying this for several years now. I can't find anywhere in the Bible where government is providing for people. I don't know where, you know, where did we get this idea that the government is where we go when we need help? That the government is where we go when there's a tsunami or an accident or a hurricane. And, you know, government's got all this money, so government owes me this money. Where is that idea coming from? Not in the Bible. In fact, the government has proven to be one of the least efficient ways to deal with problems. Because they've got all these levels of bureaucracy, and a lot of times, very little of the money actually gets where it was supposed to go. And organizations like the Red Cross and other places, uh, can, and local churches, can be much more effective at getting the job done and getting all that money there than the government. But why do we have this idea that the government's going to take care of me? It's, it's not healthy, and it's not biblical. So God said, look, you know, God cares about the poor, but his way of dealing with it is different from man's way or the government's way. And so that's kind of what we're just laying some principles here, because I want you to think about this as we go along. Now, what is socialism? Boy, that's the buzzword of the day. That's what we're hearing all the time. It's always on the news. It's in the elections now. We've got actual democratic socialists running for president of our dear country. I mean, we've had military guys over the last 200 years going and shedding their blood on foreign fields to destroy socialism, and now we're considering voting for someone that's going to implement it here? It's really an amazing thing. You got Bernie Sanders. Behind him are a whole bunch of college kids, young people. Oh, we feel the burn. We love Bernie. Why? Why? I mean, the guy it was, it was really in love with Russia. I mean, he, his own testimony is that I think he took his honeymoon there and he spent a lot of time uh, as, as uh, uh, you know, a friend to communists, and now he's running for president, and we're excited about this. Here's uh, AOC, of course. Seems pretty dire right now. She's uh, also, you know, on that same page with Bernie, Democratic Socialist. In March of 2019... Public Opinion Strategies did this poll. Democrats who prefer socialism, 77%. Registered voters who prefer socialism, just in general, registered voters, 45%, according to their survey. Voters under the age of 45 who prefer socialism, 53%. The younger generation. These numbers ought to scare us, and I've seen more than one poll or survey along these lines. Why, are, why is it that the young people, this young generation, are falling for this? Well, if you go to the Democratic Socialist website, they're going to give you three things that is really their appeal to young people. First of all, social justice. Secondly, freedom from oppression. And thirdly, economic security for all. So they talk about the social justice. You know, we want, we want justice throughout society. Well, who doesn't want justice? right? Uh, freedom from oppression. There should be no people group that's being left behind, that's being stepped on, that, you know, uh, is being disadvantaged. Okay. We all like that. I mean, we all have a heart for everybody. Like we said last night, there's only one human race. Everybody should have a chance to uh, live free and pursue God and be successful. Economic security for all in a land that is so blessed there shouldn't be anyone going to bed hungry. There, everyone should have health care. Well, yeah, of course. Yeah, wouldn't that be wonderful? If every single person could be full and have all their health care needs met, of course. You know, we would, anyone with a heart is going to love this. 
Uh, someone said, and I've tried to track it down, I don't know who said it. If you're not a liberal when you're young, you have no heart. If you're not a conservative when you're old, you have no brain. I don't know who said it, but I like it. Uh, basically, after you do the math and you realize this doesn't add up and there isn't any way to provide all this, your brain kicks in and says, we can't do that. That'll destroy us. In fact, look at Greece, look at Venezuela. Those are great examples of socialism. And uh, sooner or later, the math just doesn't add up. And, but there's something about it that appeals to young people. Yes, we want justice. We want to meet the needs. We want everyone to have everything. I'm a socialist. Now, I've seen, have you seen these men on the street interviews where they put the microphone in some kid's face and say, do you prefer socialism or, or uh, capitalism? Socialism. Okay, can you define socialism? Uh, uh, <laughs> I've seen those interviews, and it's, they'll go to these college campuses, and kid after kid after kid, oh, yeah, socialism, capitalism's horrible, it's evil, it's, it's just wrong. And uh, so what is socialism? Uh, 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 sharing the wealth, you know, uh, health care for everybody, free college. That's the best they can come up with. That's not socialism. So why would you say you're a socialist if you don't even know what it is? Because there's a real lack of education right now, and there's ignorance across the land, and Satan loves it because uh, when you're ignorant, you know, Benjamin Franklin said, tyranny begins with the ignorance of the people. I mean, when the people are ignorant, they really don't know history, they don't know what's going on, tyrants move in and say, let me take care of you. So that's why I say education is critical. Um, here's the actual definition. Government takeover of the economy by controlling industry and capital, then using this power to take from one and give to another. Okay? That's the actual definition. So you can't really sugarcoat it. It is what it is. It's the government taking over the economy. What's the economy? Well, that's your means of production, right? That's your factories, that's your uh, finance, your economy. So the government's going to take that over and manage the economy. And then they're going to take that profit from the economy and equally distribute it among the people. Not one of those college kids gave that definition, but that's what it is. You need to know the definition of socialism. Um, I got on their website, the uh, Democratic Socialist, you know, it's kind of just browsing down through there and trying to see what they believe. And uh, down in the Q&A, the question and answers at the bottom, somebody said, why don't we call this something else? Because socialism has such a bad name. I mean, the last, in the 1900s, socialism and communism killed probably 130 million people. That's really not good. So let's call it something else. And I was amazed by their answer. It said, we'll never change the name because no matter what we call it, they're going to be against us. And we would simply be giving in to them. I thought, wow, that's a pretty revealing answer. So they're not really interested in some new thing. They know what they are, and they will not change the name because it is what it is. Now, what about putting democratic in front of it? Well, let, we'll talk about that in just a second. Let me compare socialism to communism real quick. Here's the dictionary definition of communism. It's the government takeover of all property as the state or the whole claims ownership. So communism is when the government owns everything and provides everything for you. Okay, that's total control. That's like, okay, the government's going to give you land, your house, or, you know, it really doesn't, they're not giving it to you. They're providing you a place to live and clothes and enough food to keep you alive. But they basic, I mean, you, you go work, the government gets all your check and gives you back health care, a home, and clothes. 
a car, college education, that kind of stuff. But they totally own everything, the property and everything. So what's the difference between socialism and communism? Socialism, the gov government takes over the economy, factories and business and all of that. Communism, they simply own everything, the land and everything. What's the difference? Not much. Actually, it's a very small step. If you, if you went from, uh, let's say, so let's just talk about socialism for a second. The democratic socialists on their website say, we're not the bad socialists like Khrushchev and, you know, all these horrible guys, Stalin. and well, That's not the kind of socialism we are. We really just want to take over three areas because these three areas affect everybody. Healthcare, food production, and energy. Now, this is their sugar coating of socialism. Because I promise you it won't stop there. But let's just take that for, just, just stop right there and think about that. So the government's going to take, and if Bernie and these guys get in, that is exactly what they want, okay? They've already said it. I mean, it's, it is what it is. So let's just talk about health care for a second. So what they want to do is a single-payer system. In other words, your taxes, they're going to tax you at whatever rate they choose. They're going to eliminate private insurance and all the private health care going on, and the state will take over the hospitals. Then they're going to say, okay, we'll provide, we'll guarantee you health care. Well, for one thing, whatever they guarantee you isn't going to be the same quality as what you're getting right now. Whatever it is, whatever complaints you have about health care, it will only get worse. Because when you limit what doctors make and, and you take away all their incentives and there's no more competition, this hospital is competing with this hospital to be friendly, to provide services, to get you in as a customer. You know, when you take all that away and nobody cares anymore, it'll be like going to the DMV, you know, Department of Motor Vehicles. You'll be standing in a line. They, the workers really don't care. They know you don't have anywhere else, any other options anyway. You're stuck. And you get whatever they give you. So the quality is going to go down. Absolutely. Has to. You take away competition, the quality goes down. But here's the thing. If the government could provide your health care from being a little baby all the way to the grave, they can also tell you what you can and can't eat. How much exercise you have to have whether you're going to have that baby or we're going to abort that baby because we've got population control. You know, there's too many babies, there's too many males, too many females, so we're going to force abortion on you. You don't think that's true? Look at China. Look at Russia and these other places. Uh, they're already in New York telling you, you know, you can't have a soda more than what at 16 ounces or whatever it is you can't buy a soda pop within the city bigger than that because because we're paying for your health care and you folks are obese and so no longer can you know so we're going to regulate the size of your soft drinks and how many you can have and all of that and they have every right to if they're paying for your health care you get old and you start having you need a surgery well you know too bad you're uh, 60, because if you were 59, you could get that surgery. But now that you're 60, you, you don't qualify anymore. And we say you can't have that surgery. Now, I'm, that's just one. That's not even talking about food production and energy. We're just talking about health care alone. Do you really want the government making all those decisions, having that much power in your life? Because it's going to affect every day of your life. So they start off by saying, well, we just want the industries that affect everybody, healthcare, food, and energy. If they had that, it would totally change this country. Not for the good. You know, you eliminate competition with, with, even with gas prices and all that, and the government's totally in control of that. I hate to even think what, what would happen to, to our nation. But... The problem with socialism is that men aren't satisfied to, with just two or three things like that. They're going to keep expanding. That's the nature of government. 
That's why Vladimir Lenin said the goal of socialism is communism. If you're going to get people off, the, you know, capitalism means you own your property, you buy and sell, you make decisions. If you want to waste your money, that's your choice. You live with the consequences. If you want to save your money and invest your money, you get to live with those consequences, but it's up to you. That's called freedom. You get to choose what happens to your paycheck. You know, and it's interesting when you talk to these same kids, oh, I'm a socialist. Well, you start breaking it down. Do you want the government to decide what surgeries you can and can't have and what your diet's going to be every day and everything connected to your health? Well, no. Do you want the government taxing you at 70, 80, 90 percent? No. You start breaking it down, they don't really want what socialism is. They just, you know, it's just the cool thing to be right now, a socialist, whatever that means. So the problem with all of that is once government has control in those areas, they always take it further. That's the nature of the beast. And to get people off of capitalism where you're making the, all the choices to communism where the government makes all the choices, there's got to be a bridge. And these guys who are dyed in the wool, Karl Marx communists, said that bridge is socialism. Because you condition the people to where, you know, my great grandpa, his name was Guy. Isn't that an awesome name? Guy. Guy Roberts. He was a corn farmer. And I remember he lives, lived there in Lebanon, Missouri, in a little house. And and uh, oh, it's just awesome. They, they were still using horses. They didn't have electricity for their first, you know, 45, 50 years of their life. And uh, anyway, my grandpa Roberts would have been abhorred at taking help from the government. And he lived through the Depression and through some really bad times. But their mentality was, what? I'm not, I don't want help from the government. We'll take care of this. I don't care how poor we are and what we've got to do. We're not taking help from the government. Boy, have things changed in a couple generations. But there was a day, you talk about rugged individualism and capitalism. It's freedom. You decide what to do with that profit. If you want to give it to the church, you can give it to the church. If you want to give it to print Bibles or send missionaries or start Christian schools, you can do that with that money. You can't do that in socialism and communism because they're taxing you at 70, 80, 90 percent. They've already said that's what they want to do. Oh, it's only the extremely wealthy. Well, I guarantee you that definition is fluid. Who's extremely wealthy? We really all are. And it's, when they don't have enough money to pay for all their programs, they're going to start taxing lower and lower uh, on the income. And next thing you know, they're taxing all of your profit. Well, if you don't have any profit, can you give it? No, right? You can't give to missions if you don't have it. So capitalism says, look, here's this profit. You do what you want with it. Here's communism says, no, nope, we're going to tax all of that and do what we want with it. This is freedom. This is not freedom. Socialism is the bridge. Let's get them used. We got to wean them off of this to get them used to this. And the way you do that, let's just start providing services. Let's, in the name of, in, in the good name of we're helping people, the government is going to take profit, and it's not just to pay for police officers and army, military. Now it's to pay for school lunch programs and health care and uh, child, you know, education from uh, preschool and all that, all the way up through college and his lifelong education. We're going to provide all of this, and people are going to get used to that. And we're conditioning them away from thinking they need to save and take care of this and pay for this. So that's why somebody like Lenin would say the goal of socialism is communism. William Foster said there's the period of socialism, which is the first phase of communism. This guy ran for president back in the 30s here in America as a communist, Communist Party USA. But he's got a big old thick book about toward a Soviet America. That's the name of the book. And in that book, he says, yeah, 
yeah, there's the period of socialism. That gets you over to communism. Okay. What about democratic socialism? That simply means that the people are going to vote to allow the government to take over parts of the economy that affect all of us. So they put democratic in front of it to make it sound American. You know, it's like the Democratic Republic of Korea or Vietnam. Or they, they love the word democratic, but it means nothing. It doesn't matter what word you put in front of socialism, it's still socialism. You know, whether we convinced enough young, ignorant, and I don't mean that in a bad way. I just mean don't know anything. A, a bunch of young people to, yeah, yeah, let's be socialists. Did not, just because we had 51% that fell for it doesn't mean it changed the nature of socialism. It, it is what it is. It's more government in your life. Um, here's the simple problem. You can boil it down to this, big government. That's what's wrong with socialism. It's really not that hard. We're talking about big government. They talk about big pharma, big, you know, uh, farmers and, and, you know, all these big oil. Oh, it's just, it's horrible. What about big government? Isn't that horrible? Sure it is. It's terrible. In fact, that's what our founders fled, big government. You, want, you really want government getting involved in every decision of your life like that? Our founders shed their blood and lost their fortunes so that you wouldn't have to have this huge government over your head. The Constitution limits government. It says government can only do these things. And that was a good thing. I mean... Yeah, you're on your own, and it's up to you and your church and your family to figure out how to meet the needs, but you're so much better off. Um, government will always grow. It never voluntarily shrinks. Once they get power, they don't say, you know what, we've got too much power here. We need to give that power back to the people. It just doesn't happen. I mean, they love power, and anyone who has power and is getting money and popularity and influence because of this power. They're, they're not thinking, you know, I need to step away and give this up. No, that's why they're hanging around in Washington for 30, 40, 50 years. They love it and they want more of it. There's a verse in Proverbs, hell and destruction are never full, so the eyes of man are never satisfied. It's just a reality. You know, how much money is enough? I don't know, just a little bit more. You know, whatever lust. How much of this do you need? Just a little bit more. Well, power is a lust, and people lust for it, and they'll never really have enough, and that's why socialism will inevitably lead to communism or total control, because they'll never, there's never a place to cut it off and say, okay, you know, we've got health care now, that's enough. Doesn't work that way. They'll want more and more and more. It's the nature of man. That's the problem with socialism. The overriding appeal is this word equality. Socialism promises that we can equalize society, but it actually brings the whole group down to the lowest common denominator instead of allowing each one to excel to their highest potential. So, yeah, equality. Boy, we hear that word all the time. I've heard it here lately, especially income inequality and, you know, uh, racial inequality. And they, this whole thing is built on we've got to make things equal, everybody. Let's think about that. Do we? And is that even possible? And would we like it if we did? What exactly are you saying? Equal? But that is their, that's part of their appeal to young people. We're going to make this fair. We're going to make this equal. Well, hang on just a second. Let's talk about three ideas here. Uh, of this whole thing of equality, and I'm giving you Bible principles here because you really, th your worldview and politics cannot be separated from your faith and from reality of what you believe, you know, <laughs> the whole purpose of life and all of that. You, you can't separate it, and that's why we as God's people better pay attention to this stuff and get it in our own hearts so we can share it with others. But this idea of personal equality, you know, uh, the Bible tells us that God has created each one of us as a unique individual. He didn't make two grains of sand the same. 
He didn't make two snowflakes the same. He didn't make two stars the same. And he didn't make two people the same. And aren't you glad? Aren't you glad there's not another person running around this planet exactly like you? Wouldn't that be weird to run into that person who is exactly like you? <laughs> I wouldn't want one more. I sure wouldn't want a hundred of me. Equal. Is that really possible? Here, you know, it's amazing. God made some of us artists, you know? They can just sit down at a palette and start painting, and it looks amazing. Some folks are musicians. They can hear it. They can play it. They can sing it. It's just natural. Others, not so much, right? Some folks are accountants. They love crunching numbers. They love doing the math. They want to make sure that bottom number comes out exactly down to the penny right. I really don't understand people like that, but I'm glad they're out there. My son, my oldest son is one of those. It's just amazing that he likes that. Some folks are naturally athletes. They're just gifted. They're good at it. Some folks are woodworkers. I think about guys who look at a tree and think, you know, if I cut down that tree, I could make something really cool. You know, and in their mind, they're thinking about how they could build it and, you know, measure it and design it and craft it. And, and when they're done, they've got this beautiful piece of furniture. Some folks are doctors. I, I always think about people who want to get inside of you and fix you. I mean, they went to school for years to do this. You know, they're thinking, if I could just get you on that operating table, you know, I'm going to cut down through all those layers, and I'm going to get to your liver, and I'm going to fix it. And then I'm going to sew you back up, and you're going to be good to go. <laughs> I'm thinking if I cut one layer on somebody, I'd be passed out on the floor. You know, there's no way... I, I, I just can't handle it. I, I'm so glad somebody thinks that way. But we could go on and on with this. Some fo- science, you know, they love science. Some folks are construction workers. They think about how to make sure this uh, roof doesn't fall. You know, how big does that beam need to be? What's it need to be made out of? Uh, how many of them do we need? How far apart are they? Most of us come in here and we just plop down in a chair. But somebody had to think this through. Somebody loves that. Aren't you glad? Somebody cares about that. Uh, CEOs, they're in charge of billions of dollars and thousands of employees. They take over a company that's in the red and think, you know, I can make this thing. I can turn this ship around. We're going to be successful. I mean, it's just in them. They love it. It's a challenge. Other people are like, no, maybe five or ten people I could manage. That's about it. Other people say, show me the time clock. I'm punching in. I'm punching out. I'm going home. I don't want any headaches or stress. Now, why is it that we're all different like this? Because we could go on and on, right? But you are not like anybody else. You're one of a kind. And God has given you a special combination of desires and talents and abilities, and there isn't anyone else just like you. You know, there was a day in America where we said, that's amazing. That's awesome. You know, some, some kid is going to be really, here's what we used to say. Dream big and whatever it is you wish you could do, pursue it with all you've got. I mean, go to school, work hard, train, get in there and be the best of whatever it is in front of you. That's what the declaration says when it means the pursuit of happiness. We're not talking about drugs and and sex and all kinds, that kind of happiness. We're talking about you are created as an individual with a drive, with a desire, with a dream to accomplish something maybe that no one else has ever accomplished. Go for it. In America, you have permission to do that. In America, you're encouraged to do that. Wait, 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 wait. What if that person makes a million dollars doing what they're good at? Well, that would be evil, right? No. Why would that be evil? You mean this guy wants to be a doctor and he studies and he's doing something, brain surgery or something that's very difficult and very few people have the hand-eye coordination and the intellect to be able to do that and he's getting paid millions of dollars a year to do it. That's bad. Why would that be bad? 
Some people don't have the desire to do that. But I'm glad the guy's there that wants to do it and is really good at it because someday I'm going to need that guy. Someday I'm going to be in a building that someone built. Someday I'm going to drive over a bridge that someone built. I want to make sure they were the best they could be and they were educated and they pursued that passion. Flying in an airplane, somebody dreamed that, somebody worked hard, somebody risked their capital to make that dream come true and now we all enjoy the fruit of that. Here's the thing about rugged individualism and capitalism. It lifts all of us. If everyone in this room will do what God created them to do and they'll be the absolute best at it that they can be, which is the Bible principle, what thy hand findeth to do, do it with all thy might. Whatsoever you do, whether you eat, drink, or whatever, do it to the glory of God. You've only got one life. Be the best you can be. That was the American way. What's happening to that? Oh, no, 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 we can't keep score. That's going to make somebody feel bad. No, you know, we're all winners. Every kid knows that really just means we're all losers, right? I didn't win. You just said I was a winner. You know, we can't really have grades. Come on, I mean, it's E for effort or, you know, T for try harder next time. You know, I, I mean... We can't really have A's and B's and F's, and that might scar someone's ego. No, what it might do is light a fire under them. Or it might cause them to say, you know what, I'm never going to be the star football player. I just have to acknowledge that. So what am I good at? What could I do? It's okay to fail because then you start figuring out what you're not going to do. But there's something you can do, and you better be really good at it, even if it's just being a, a, a parent or a spouse or a faithful employee. You know, figure out where you fit on the ladder and be the best you can be at that, and you'll love life. But this idea that we're going to equalize everybody, what that really means is we're going to pull down achievers to try to make underachievers feel better about their failure. Socialism robs us of the incentive to excel and be the best we can be. And I'm not just saying that. I've talked to several people from socialist countries. They told me that. We went to a guy, uh, there was a guy in uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, that came up after one of these sessions and said, you know, that's exactly right. He said, I'm from the Ukraine, Russia. I grew up in the atheist school system in Russia. They teach you from the time you're a little kid all the way through the system. There is no God, kids. There's no creator. And I mean, they just drill it into you. This guy ended up getting saved anyway. Pastored three underground churches. Came to America whenever Putin moved into the Ukraine on a religious asylum. Lives in Tulsa. His wife's from uh, Crimea, same thing. And he said, you know what? I lived that whole system. It's terrible. He said, I I don't understand why kids in America would be thinking socialism's good. It's horrible. He said, yeah. He said, you know, first of all, it robs you of your dignity. You're not going to pursue life and be all you can be when you're just used to every time you have a need, you go to government. So you go get in the line and you stand there and wait until you get up to the thing, and then you put your hand out, and they give you some bread, they give you what you need, and then you go back to your home. He said it robs you of any dignity. You don't achieve anything. You don't accomplish anything. You don't risk anything. You don't build anything. He said it's amazing how demeaning it is to not own anything, and I'd never thought about that because in America... That's just the way it is. We own stuff. He said, it's it's terrible. You have no self-worth if you don't own anything. I just never put that together. But he's basically saying, you know how it is when you worked hard, you saved up your allowance, you did whatever, and you bought that thing, whatever it was, there was a certain accomplishment there. Ball glove or whatever it is going to take care of that thing, right? 
because you had to buy it. It came out of your sweat, right? Your hard work. Imagine a world where you take all that away and now you're going to come like some poor beggar to the government guy and say, uh, you know, I, I need clothes. Well, okay. We think he said, here's one thing he said. We could always tell when a foreigner was in our village because their clothes were colorful. He said, they always gave, they gave us a home, health care, car, education, everything, clothes, but they only gave us what they thought we needed. Never more. He said, it began to dawn on me as I got older. Where does the government get money? And then he realized, it's our money. They force us to work. You have to work. And they keep all the profit from whatever work you did. And then they dole it out as they desire. It's a pretty sad state. And it totally eliminates that. You know, he said that's probably one reason why 80% of our guys are drunk. They just live in a, in a totally drunken state. Because they have no incentive. They have nothing, you know, driving them to get out of bed every day. And he said, and then I would come to America. He said, the first thing they did was try to get me on a welfare program. And I said, no, thank you. I don't want it. <laughs> Here's a Russian coming to America. They're trying to sign him up for all these food and programs. And he says, No. He said, you know, that car out there doesn't look like much to anybody, and it was a little white minivan. Had a couple American flag stickers on the back. Ronald Reagan stickers. He said, that car doesn't look like much to anybody, but it means everything to my wife and I because we bought it. It's just an old junker car, but we bought it. He was thrilled. And then he says, and I see American young people acting like socialism is the answer to all their problems. It is not. So this idea of equality on a personal level, I don't think we want it. And so a guy makes a billion dollars doing what he's good at. So what concern is that to me? They say, you know, capitalism is built on greed, right? Because you're going to go out there and you're going to be greedy and you're going to make all this profit. Well, I would actually call it incentives, not greed. And you got the incentive to work hard and you might pay, it might pay off. But if that's true that capitalism is built on greed, isn't socialism built on envy? What is that person doing with all that money? And I don't have it. That's envy. So government's going to step in and equalize all that? They're really not, and it's not desirable if they even could. This thing of financial equality, which, you know, they talk about income inequality. There's just terrible that some people make millions and billions, and other people are just barely getting by on a minimum wage job and all of that, right? So <clears throat> to them, it's always class warfare. And if you read Karl Marx, who's the granddaddy of them all, he constantly talks about the ownership class and the worker class proletariat, the workers. And it's like there's this wall. And if you weren't born into the ownership class, you're just stuck. And the only hope you have is if government comes in and removes that wall and pulls down the owners and the government owns everything and then everybody can be on the same plane. That's socialism. What's freedom? There's no wall. There's a ladder. Freedom says... I don't care who you are, where you're from, there's a ladder. Go for it. If you want to climb up those rungs, go for it. If you want to stay on a bottom rung, go for it. It's freedom. It's not about the amount of money you made. It's about the freedom you had to decide where you're supposed to be on that ladder. And you, you go to it. You work it out with God. But you're free to move up and down that ladder. You know, some people are really aggressive when they're young, and so they, they climb up that ladder. They get older, and they want to slow down. They want to retire. They want to fish and golf. 
they come back down the ladder a few rungs. So when I was a young person, I loved the Lord with all my heart. I, I, I just, God got a hold of me. And I surrendered and I said, you know, I, I was challenged by good preaching at good camps and, and all of that. But I remember, you know, deny yourself, right? Take up my cross and follow me. You could gain the whole world and lose your soul. Or you could get a hold of your soul and, and pass on the world, you know, that kind of preaching. And I was so fired up, I said, God, I don't care what you want me to do. I surrender. But I knew at that moment, I'll never be a millionaire. I'll never, I'll never have, live in a mansion. But that was my choice. I'm so glad I had the freedom to pursue God, knowing I wouldn't make any money. You know, there's preachers and missionaries all around that are so glad they had the freedom to choose. It's not about the money. It's about the freedom to choose. And if you want to choose to, uh, you know, go into some profession that potentially makes millions and billions of dollars, you have the freedom to choose that. But not everyone's cut out for that, you know. And so we find our place on that ladder. That's freedom. Socialism doesn't look at it that way. They think you're stuck in a class. If you're, if you're a Mexican or a black or a whatever, a female, you're stuck in your little thing, and uh, government's got to come in and rescue you. That's their worldview. So this thing of financial equality, we can't be fi equal financially. That's not even possible. If we took all your money right now and replaced it with a million dollars, so everyone sitting in this room has a million dollars, and we came back next week to check in. How many of it, how, would it be equal next week? It probably wouldn't be equal tonight. <laughs> yeah. Some of you are going to blow it. Some of you are going to invest it. Some of you are going to save it. You know, how in the world? You can't be equal. That's not even possible. By the way, Jesus did say the poor you'll have with you always. So, I mean, I, we, we need to have compassion. We need to love each other and give to But this idea that we're going to eliminate poverty, it's not even biblical. Then secondly, socialism doesn't eliminate rich and poor anyway. It only makes the government rich and the people poor. And so you look at any socialist nation, the government's doing fine. It's the people who are in bread lines, starving, eating out of trash cans. And then thirdly, socialism denies the reality of incentives by calling it greed, demonizing anyone that tries to get out there and, and make a profit, which, you know, there's greedy people who are socialists, just like there's greedy people who are capitalists, you know. It really isn't about the economic system, it's about the heart of man. And uh, anyway, let's go ahead here. William Bradford, and, and just for sake of time, I'm probably not going to read all this. But basically, the pilgrims experimented with the form of socialism, communism, communal living, and basically said, we're going to have all of our meat, drink, apparel, and provisions out of the common stock and goods of the said colony. So these are the pilgrims that came over in 1620. They're coming to a wilderness. They thought, we better stick together. Everyone's going to work, and we're going to put all of our stuff in a big warehouse. And then when you need it, you go get it, right? Sounds pretty good. If you need clothes, they're there. If you need food, it's there. We're all taking care of each other. We better stick together. Well, how'd that go? The experiment was found to breed much confusion and discontent and retard much employment for the young men that were most able and fit for labor and service did repine that they should spend their time and strength to work for other men's wives and children without any recompense. In other words, it didn't work. They realized, man, I'm out here breaking my back 10, 12 hours a day in the hot sun, but when it's all said and done, I get the same amount of food and clothes as the person who worked an hour. What's that going to do to your desire to work? It's going to, yeah, I'm going to get by with the least I can get by with. And that's exactly what happens with socialism. Let's just get by with the least we can do because the government's going to take care of it anyway. And uh, so anyway, they were miserable and they, they switched over to giving every family a parcel of land. That's private property. You own this. If you grow corn on it, you get to eat. If you don't, I don't know what you're going to do. And every family then 
was, it's up to them, rugged individualism. And look what he said. This had very good success. It made all hands very industrious. So uh, the whole attitude changed. So when we celebrate uh, Thanksgiving, you know, they were being thankful to God for the abundance, but that abundance was because of capitalism, private property. So we've already experimented with this idea of let's just, you know, take care of each other and uh, the, our government, you know, our state will make sure everybody has what they need. We've already tried that. It didn't work. It isn't going to work now because you're dealing with human nature. The producers will not produce under those uh, conditions. I don't care how good-hearted you are. These guys were Bible-believing people, you know. I mean, they come in here for religious freedom, and it didn't work for them. Um, the last thing is the religious equality, and I just will say this in closing. There's definitely a spiritual element to all of this. And uh, as I've been telling you, everything we've been talking about, on the socialist side of things, it's anti-Bible. You know, private property, capitalism, taking care of each other on a personal level. They're, you know, everything they're promoting is against the Bible. And America was built on Bible principles. And that's why America is still the number one economy in the world. We have the highest GDP of anybody. And we're talking 240 years later. And the socialist countries are floundering. They can't pay their bills. And the degree of debt we have right now in America is because of the degree of socialism we've introduced. It's not because we're paying our military too much. It's because we've got too many entitlements. But uh, it boils down to, do you believe in God's system or, or man's system? And uh, I'm going to... Let me just get to the last quote, oh, Karl Marx. My object in life is to dethrone God and destroy capitalism. That's a stunner, isn't it? Dethrone God. Um, th there's a spiritual side to this. And he saw capitalism as a way for God's people to invest in God's work. And he, it was his mission to destroy that ability. Let the government make those decisions. Anyway, let's go ahead... There's a really good quote from um, <laughs> Bernie. Okay, Solzhenitsyn. Uh, well, maybe we can revisit this later. Here, here's the one I want to close with, Herbert Hoover. Our founding fathers did not invent the priceless boon of individual freedom and the respect for the dignity of men. All that we've been talking about, individual freedom, the dignity of every unique individual under God to pursue God's will for their life. Our founding fathers didn't invent that. That great gift to mankind sprang from the creator, not from governments. The founding fathers with superb genius welded together the safeguards of these freedoms. Today, the socialist virus and poison gas generated by Karl Marx and Frederick Engels have spread into every nation on the earth. Their dogma is absolute materialism, which defies truth and religious faith. So here's Herbert Hoover, one of our presidents, saying, socialism is absolutely against the Bible. It defies truth and religious faith. In other words, if we become a socialist nation, you could say goodbye to the Bible and the Constitution. You can say goodbye. They're not compatible. If we're going to hang on to the Bible and the Constitution, say goodbye to socialism because they don't work together. And that's exactly what he's saying. He goes on and says, the nation is strong or weak. It thrives or perishes on what it believes to be true. If our youth is rightly instructed in the faith of our fathers, the traditions of our country, that would be the rule of law, the declaration, the uh, uh, Constitution, limited government, and the dignity of every single individual. Those three things. Our power will be stronger than any weapon of destruction that man can devise. And now as to this whole gamut of socialist infections, I say to you, God has blessed us with another wonderful word, heritage. The great documents of our heritage are not from Karl Marx. Boy, we need to hear that today. He didn't, he didn't come up with what made America great. He's doing everything he could to destroy it. Where's our heritage from? 
The Bible, the Declaration, and the Constitution, within them alone can the safeguards of freedom survive. Those are profound words. Boy, we need to hear that in this generation. You better get back to the Bible that tells you why you were created and that your self-worth comes because you're made in God's image. And you're a one of a kind put here to do one thing, you know, do it really well. Live your life. The Declaration puts the Lord above all earthly kings and says governments are only established to protect God-given rights. And the Constitution, limit government and don't let them out of that box. Because once they start getting out, there's no putting them back in without a bloody war. They will not voluntarily give up power. You better keep them in the box. Within those three documents alone can freedom survive. Lord, help us to understand these things. Help us to, more than anything, God, make us better teachers. We've got to be creative and help this generation understand what's really going on. Please help us to be more effective. And I pray if there's some young people here that need to surrender to be teachers, preachers, missionaries, or to go into government, whatever it is, Lord, that you have for them, Make it crystal clear. Help them to understand that they have a place. They're part of this battle. And uh, give us the wisdom to know what we can do, Lord, that you would work through us for the cause of truth and right. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, praise the Lord for that. I hope that you were listening and learned a few things, the dangers of socialism, it would take about 40 hours to go through that, and that really still isn't completing at all. People are so duped. I mean, back in the 1900s, it was promoted when I was in school. Um, <clears throat> Hosea 4, 6 starts with this: these words, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. According to the Bible, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. It all starts with God through Christ, by the Holy Spirit, from the Word of God. That's where it all comes from. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Well, we're headed in that direction in one of the three, well, maybe two of the three, or maybe all three of the three institutions that God started. Family's been redefined. It's just people you live close to. God defined it as the parents and the children. That's how God defined it. We've redefined it in our nation and throughout the world. The church itself, local churches as an institution founded by God, well, that's been changed an awful lot as well. But government is where we're seeing the biggest push for all of this stuff because that's where the redefinition of family comes from. That's where the redefinition of whatever. And, of course, if Beto gets to be president, you can't have a church that doesn't preach what, what he wants. And so he's going to shut it down if you don't preach the, the, the government way, the state-sponsored church. Of course, that goes against expressly. Uh, for those of you that weren't here yesterday, it, the First Amendment, people think the First Amendment is freedom of speech. It absolutely is not, actually. It's freedom of religion. Freedom of speech is part of freedom of religion. Read the, read the First Amendment. Um, it's, it's basically all founded upon that freedom to worship and, and all that stuff. So another, another important document, and I want to just throw this out. So we have the Bible, and of course the Constitution and the Declaration aren't going to make a lot of sense if you don't have a Bible. And if you're an atheist trying to interpret the Constitution, you're not going to be able to make sense of it. And so you're just going to desire to change it. Well, you got to get in the Bible, the most important document there is, God's holy word. And then for us, you know, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, and I want, to, want you to think about this over lunch, a, a, a document, it's actually a speech, but it's called this, it's simply called Not Yours to Give, okay? Not Yours to Give. Uh, all, uh, you, you, can, you can look that up during lunch, you can talk to someone, you can whatever, but uh, I'll ask something about it in the next session <clears throat> before the, the preaching in the book of Daniel, right? We're still going there, is that what you said? Did you go to Samuel? Okay. Um, so looking forward to that, that charge, that impetus for, for each of us to, to actually put into practice what God is, is doing, but not yours to give. Okay, just those simple words, not yours to give. You'll be uh, surprised at who wrote it, 
and who said it because we don't think of him as a government person, but indeed he was. All right, so, um, and then lastly, the, uh, the socialists, all the people pushing for socialism, none of them want to be part of the ruled class. They want to be part of the ruling class, and it is ironic that Marx was very much against a class society, and yet he established his own classes, because no one wants to be the ruled. That man that, that uh, Brother Myers was talking to from the Ukraine, he wasn't part of the ruling class. He grew up under the oppression of socialism that other people decided those rules. Well, everyone fighting for socialism are the ones that want to make the rules and get all the money and decide where it goes. Everyone else is just a subject or whatever, so uh, no one likes to think about it that way. And then they desire equality as long as I get to determine what equality is. And there's no room for Christians. So you're either going to have to recant or be killed. It's happened in every country. Every country that embraces socialism. Don't think for a moment it won't happen here. Because it will. Unless you stand up and you make a change because you have the power to do that. Standing on the Word of God, empowered by the Spirit of God, for the glory of God, you can make a difference. All right, we're ready. Let's pray. Lord, we love you and we thank you for the lunch we're about to have. We thank you, Lord. Uh, just for the freedom to come and to sit and to learn, and Lord, for Brother Myers and what you've done in his life over the years and how you've uh, brought him here to help us, to preach, to teach, to show us, to help us. God, I, I thank you for that. And I just ask you to bless the fellowship and the food, and Lord, just bless this time that friendships can grow, and, and Lord, that we can just have some, some good godly discussions and a, and a good time uh, for your glory. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. All right. So the restrooms are down the hallway. The ladies is right there, and then the guys is like a quick right and a left uh, down there. We're going to go out these doors right here, these ladies. Uh, Alyssa, you want to raise your hand there and wave? And, and uh, 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 do you want to? I was going to have her wave and go woohoo, but she left because she saw it coming. Okay. Um, so we're going to line up right over here. There's two sides of the table. They've got some food over there. And then we'll come back in here at 1 o'clock. So you got some time to hang out. Uh, get to know somebody. There's some footballs or something somewhere or whatever. You guys can just hang out and we'll holler at you at 1 o'clock.